So good morning, everybody, and welcome. And thank you for being with us here today. Uh, we have a full house here, and we have quite a number of people online already uh, actually uh, watching us online as well as we do the live webcast. So you're all very welcome uh, to this event. And um, I suppose, in a way, um, this is, it's, it's kind of notable that this is five years now since the Sustainable Development Goals were actually agreed at the United Nations. And uh, these are 17 goals set out by the UN uh, and agreed by all the countries' members there to actually guide de policy development and to achieve particular targets uh, within the next uh, 10 years, by 2030. They were a 15-year target when they were originally uh, agreed in 2015. So um, they set out pretty good goals that would be the kinds of uh, things that you'd like to achieve, uh, that you'd like to have in place if you were to have a vibrant society, a decent society, uh, a sustainable society, those kinds of issues. So um, every year uh, since the establishment of the goals or since the agreement of the goals, Social Justice Ireland has commissioned uh, a report on how Ireland is doing and how we re rank compared to others uh, in, that, in that process. Uh, and we have a, want to say a special thank you to Professor Charles Clark from St. John's University in New York, who's here with us today, and to Dr. Catherine Kavanagh from UCC, the economics department there, and to Niamh Lenehan from the Cork Institute of Technology, because the three of them together uh, produce and um, do this report uh, each year for us and they do a, an excellent job and uh, we're more than uh, glad that they're prepared to do it for us and then that they can uh, come um, and present it for us. It's an opportune time uh, right now uh, to be thinking in terms of uh, how Ireland is performing. Uh, what we're doing in this, and this will be explained to you uh, in the presentation, is we're comparing, our, we're looking at how Ireland itself is doing uh, on each of the 17 goals, and then we're ranking Ireland compared to all of the other countries in the European Union 15, in the EU 15 as it's known. Now the reason we focus on the EU 15 is that these are our peer countries, and these are the countries that Irish people want to be ranked against. They don't want to be benchmarked against countries that have much lower standards or haven't achieved the same level of infrastructure or services. They want to be, I think most Irish people want to see the same level of services and infrastructure and so on, uh, a vibrant economy and so on in Ireland as we see in France and Germany and uh, across the, uh, the Nordic countries and so on. And uh, that's why we benchmark Ireland against our peers, if you like. That's a, a kind of a true comparison in our view. Um, not alone that, we break down the actual goals into three sub-indexes, uh, uh, one economic, one social, and one environmental, and all of that will be explained. The reason that it's so opportune right now is because we're in the throes of discussions about what a new program for government would look like. And I would respectfully suggest that this report contains a great many things that would be very uh, helpful and would be very, uh, very helpful for those negotiating maybe, but even more so would be good for Ireland if they were actually adopted. And so the last part of the report looks specifically at policy proposals and implications both at a national and local level for each of the 17 goals and they're all spelt out there. I should say um, the full report is downloadable on our site at this time, as well as being able to watch the, 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 the live webcast. Unfortunately, um, Kath, Dr. Catherine Kavanagh from UCC can't be with us today for other reasons, for other issues. So her part of the report uh, will be presented by our colleague uh, Colette Bennett, that many of you know, and um, is well. She handles all this stuff for us in, the, in a very good way, so she'd be well, well up to presenting the, the report. She's very familiar with the material and so on. So without any further ado, uh, I call on Professor Clark uh, to begin the, present, his, the first part of the presentation of Measuring Progress, the Sustainable Progress Index for 2020. Thank you.
Thank you, Sean. Uh, I'd like to thank my co-authors, Catherine and Eve. Uh, as is typical of uh, gender roles, they did all the hard work, dealing with all the number crunching and collecting, and I do the easy job of pointing out the obvious. So, uh, what, 25 years ago, Sean asked Catherine and I if we could come up with an index to sort of put up against gross domestic product, which is the main way economists measure things. Uh, and back then it was very hard. There weren't many examples. Uh, we came out with a study in 1996 based on the index of social health, which, is, uh, which was just started in the United States. Uh, and at the time, uh, you know, we were the outliers. Uh, people were still defending GDP, but today, most Nobel Prize winning economists will say GDP is not a good measure of social well-being. In fact, the manual used to instruct countries on how to make GDP or national income accounting systems more uniform at the United Nations, uh, this is SNA 2008, S Systems of National Accounting, uh, mentions that this is not uh, a good measure of social well-being. Uh, GDP is designed for something specific uh, in terms of informing governments and some decisions, but mostly to give uh, uh, some data analysis that help businesses make decisions. I mean, GDP was developed to help the United States and England plan for World War II and how much military production they would be able to accomplished during the war. They had to figure, calculate how many bombs and how many tanks could we make, and this is how the national income accounting systems were created. Uh, so they're, they're useful information, but in terms of how a country should rearrange all their policies, uh, this is not necessarily the best guide of whether we're doing the right things, because uh, you could have a booming GDP and for the average person not to be able to feel it uh, so much. Let's see. Okay. So I'm going to just give a quick overview of the uh, relationship between economic growth and progress and why uh, having broader measures, I think, is more useful, and then look at some issues in terms of uh, measuring, uh, particularly in relation to, we'll do a short look at using the broader approach of the SDGs to look at something like the Great Recession uh, and how you respond to that uh, in Ireland, just as an example. Okay, and a good example of this sort of new way of approaching public policy is New Zealand's well-being budget. Uh, this is something that's recommended by the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the United Nations, different agencies, have been pushing this, so this isn't some sort of left-wing idea or a hippie government. This is what leading experts are suggesting governments should do. And it's not throwing out normal budgeting. It's not counting things in a different way. Uh, or it's laying out what are the priorities based on what actually improves people's lives. How are they going to achieve it? And for a government budget, Mostly that means what expenditures of money or what changes in laws we're going to enact in order to have this result, but then also laying out indicators so that we can assess, is it working? Is the policy actually having the effects? Can we monitor it to see, are we doing the right thing? Should we change uh, strategy? That's very important to be able to not just have a feeling and not to have policy designed by ideology, but to have evidence that shows whether you're achieving the goals that you lay out. And a key part of this is laying out the values upon which we are setting our priorities. Uh, this is an important part of public engagement that the, the, as part of the political process, this gets decided as to what will be the priorities, and then how are we going to uh, achieve them. Uh, now, the approach that social scientists use is 
uh, in one couple cases been called the Anna Karenina principle, but it's based on the famous first line of Tolstoy's book, happy families are all alike, every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way, and that is you set out what are the factors that make for a happy family, uh, and then you assess the unhappiness based on how they deviate from those. Uh, this is how social scientists try to be scientific by looking at what are the fundamental factors. In economics, we would say what are the long-run factors, not the short-term uh, things that vary, but what are the persistent, dominant and persistent forces that have the always affecting what you're trying to look at, and then how do you uh, come to understand them, uh, measure them, uh, and use that to guide your analysis. But there's also a trend to try to minimize those factors. And of course, it's one thing to say, well, there are five important factors. If we say there are 50 important factors, well, then there's probably zero important factors. How do you assess 50 factors in, in your head when you're trying to think about something? Uh, so that there is a common sense reason to try to have as few as is necessary. But the trend often goes to how to reduce it to one or two. And of course, if we go back to Tolstoy with his uh, happy families, the factors that he mentions are all what makes a happy family for the male head of the household. Now these are important <laughs> as a man, uh, at least a male member in a household, but if you ask other people in the household, they might add to that list as something that's important, uh, what's being neglected. So that it's important to keep in mind that how these priorities are set uh, very much reflects who has the power to set them. And so democratizing that as much as possible is an important way to allow more voices to be heard. In setting the sustainable development goals, which were built on the, the Millennium Development Goals, which was set by a small group of experts. The UN got a lot of criticism and so had a big effort to try to get as much input from different groups in the process and eventually became a huge lobbying effort as each group was trying to get their particular issue as one of, if not a 17 goal, at least one of the measurable indicators. Uh, I myself uh, added some lobbying for uh, measures in terms of modern uh, forced labor or human trafficking. They were going to measure child labor. I said, well, let's see if we can measure this as well. Yeah, so you had a lot of this going on at the UN at the time, but they also had a considerable outreach program to young people. Uh, a former student of mine ran it for the United Nations and was going to huge festivals in different countries setting up tents to meet young people and, and asking them questions, engaging them. So there was an attempt to get as many voices as possible engaged in the process. Okay, so if we look at the history of, uh, of this effort to measure how the economy is doing, uh, it starts with the beginning of what is a national economy. So before 1600, you wouldn't have anything that you would call a national economy. You had what's called a natural economy. You, you have the medieval manor, or the plantation, or the farm, or the city-state, but you didn't have a large area that looked at itself as an interconnected economy until around the 1600s or so. And what economists call the mercantilist period, 1600 to 1800. Uh, and there, population was the major indicator. If you had a big population, you were a strong, prosperous country. In the Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith refers to China's prosperity and his evidence is that they have 200 million souls. You know, so the, the pop, size of your population is a big indicator of how your country is doing. And of course, if that's your indicator, then your policy is at least partially based on how do I make it grow? And of course, what we saw is horrible ways in terms of conquering the people next to you or enslaving the people who are, are, are in other continents. Uh, the 1600, 1800 is not a period where we look at you know, nice, peaceful economic policy. It's imperialism, colonialism, 
uh, slave trade, et cetera. Uh, so population is probably, if your country has a declining population, something's probably going wrong, but it's probably not the best measure uh, to what you want to strive to try to use as your measure and then have your policy try to influence it. Becoming common now, uh, but it was for a long time, migration. Because if your people are leaving your country, that's an indicator things aren't going well. If people are coming there, that's a sign that, well, this is a good place to live. It's attracting people. These are what are known as push and pull factors. Uh, migration is a big issue in the United States and in Europe in the last 15 years. And one of the ways to try to reduce migration is to eliminate the pull factors, which is if I make my, economy, my country less attractive, maybe less people will come, which is not really a good policy for the people who are living there. Uh, and so running your country based on that has not worked out well. But mostly since World War II, economic growth has been the major policy goal. Uh, before you have democracies, it was the accumulation of gold and money by the king or the merchants that dominated policy. But eventually, how much your country produces, uh, which after World War II became measured as gross domestic product, gross national product, uh, eventually gross domestic product per capita. And then real gross domestic product as we try to look at standards of living. So we can make everyone in this room, we can double your income uh, by just raising your income and and of course, then prices raise, and then your real standard of living hasn't changed. Uh, and so trying to adjust for purchasing power, how much people can consume is really the indicator that economists and governments often are trying to look at. And this is based largely on the view that humans maximize utility and that the major way they do that is by consuming in a market. So that is the key variable we want to measure for how a country is doing. This gets to a lot of the reasons why there are limitations to gross domestic product. Because there's a lot of spending that adds to GDP, but isn't necessarily increasing well-being. So if I live in a high crime area, I'm going to put a second and third lock on my house. I'm going to buy all sorts of home security systems. Am I better off? Well, I feel like I'm better off because I'm spending the money, so I'm, I'm better off in that sense. But I would be really better off if, well, if the crime rate went down and I wasn't so afraid and spending this money defensively. Uh, there's a famous article in the New York Times when this issue started to get a lot of press that one of the best things for an economy is a man going through divorce and cancer at the same time because you're generating expenditures like mad. I mean, cancer is very expensive, and divorce means two households, two refrigerators, two of everything, not to mention all the counseling. You know, it's really good for GDP. One of the first uh, critics of GDP, and this is while it was being created, uh, was a friend of John Maynard Keynes, Arthur Pigou, uh, who once said that uh, when I marry my housekeeper, GDP goes down. Uh, because before I was paying her to do these things, then after it, she's not. Uh, but have we improved the economy? Uh, and of course, there's also a lot of uh, things that are important that aren't going to be measured. You know, the most important factor for people's uh, level of happiness is family and friendships. Do they have personal connections? Uh, and these are things that do, are not going to be measured in gross domestic product. And of course, wars, natural disasters, all these things are great for generating expenditures. Uh, and they're all good. A lot of expenditures have effects on other people. Pollution is good for the economy, but it's bad for everyone who is affected by the pollution. Uh, and so this has been recognized increasingly uh, by mainstream economists as limitations that have to be uh, addressed in understanding how the economy is doing. Ireland has its own unique uh, 
problems in terms of gross domestic product. And this became very pronounced and noticeable in 2015 when the growth GDP grew by 25%, which, you know, is impossible. <laughs> Ireland did not produce one-fourth more of everything in one year. And this is also not, you know, the first year after a huge decline. If the economy went down by 20% and then up by 25 you could say, well, we're just recapturing what was lost. Uh, but this is many years after the decline. Ireland was out of the recession. Uh, and of course, this is fairly well known now. Uh, most of this is due to two companies locating businesses in Ireland and booking their profits, Apple being one, where there are somewhere in Dublin there's an office that owns the patents for the rest of the company. And any unit in the company that uses those patents on paper, and I think somewhere in California, uh, the money is transferred to that office, booked as a profit because of the low tax rate, and then dispersed to shareholders and all the other places that profits go to. Uh, is this output in Ireland? No, it's not. Uh, and so because of Ireland's tax laws, we have an increasing use of this. So we see in table one uh, on, I guess it's your, Right hand, your left hand side, Ireland, uh, second highest in our 15 country group uh, and GDP per capita, 56.6% above the EU 15 average that we use. Uh, that just isn't reasonable. Uh, whereas if we measure in terms of actual household consumption, then Ireland is just at the average, you know, it's 0.1% above the average. Well, that is something that we could say, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Uh, and so, in fact, the government calculates, but I haven't found anyone using it, but it's good that they're calculating. The CSO calculates an adjusted GDP that tries to take away all the benefits of the foreign enterprises being lo located. In, uh, but even then, it, it's, there's probably some exaggeration because 25% in 2015 is ridiculous, but 9.4 is also probably an exaggeration of some sort. Away. Okay, so the big trend now is coming up with some sort of quality of life uh, measures, and the Sustainable Development Goals are an example of this. Uh, interestingly enough, a big push in the impetus towards this area is Dwight Eisenhower, President of the United States from 1953 to 1960, uh, who famously, when he left office, gave a speech on warning us about the military industrial complex, uh, in the same year set up a commission that warns about what they call the affluence paradox. And that is, we're getting richer and richer and richer, and yet the people's lives aren't improving in the same proportion. And a lot of people, and that poverty could grow at the same time the economy is healthy and, and booming. Uh, so. Uh, uh, Eisenhower was way ahead of his time. Uh, and so from that commission, which full report came out after he was out of office, we start to get a generation of a lot of social statistics, health statistics, beyond, going beyond just measuring output. And so we have in figure eight, uh, a economist used the commission's recommendations in 62, based on 1975 data, uh, came out with an analysis which I've taken out that are 15 countries to show uh, a few things. One, where Ireland is in 1975 with our other comparables, but also we see that the influence of GDP slows down considerably as it increases. That means you can see at the beginning at low incomes, increasing in in income helps, but at some point it starts to flatten. In figure nine, using the very extensive social uh, progress indicator, this is one of the big uh, uh, setups that looks at, platforms that looks at, you know, I think 74 different factors. Uh, and there we see that there's a strong significant poor countries. They look at 156 countries. Uh, these are the orange. But once we get to above 30,000, 
in uh, per capita GDP, we see it flattens out. In fact, the R square is 0 0.0087, which means income is not having an effect where your country's uh, social progress index mm -hmm. score is, is not a function of its income level. And we see many examples of this, particularly the United States, one of the richest countries, uh, we do horribly on health outcomes. You know, for most health outcomes, the United States doesn't make the top 30, things like infant mortality or life expectancy after a cancer diagnosis and all sorts of uh, health statistics that you figure that the country that's at the cutting edge of medical research would perform really well in. You know, and if you're affluent, America has the greatest health care you can get, but you have to be affluent and have that coverage. If you don't, then you're just excluded from that. And then many areas, areas of uh, urban areas in America have infant mortality rates that fit more in uh, developing countries than they would in uh, the richest country in the world. And so it's not so much how the economy is doing or how GDP is doing, it's all these other factors. Okay, then we take a quick look, which I will take a very quick look at. Uh, if we look at the Great Recession, not just through the lens of unemployment and GDP, which is the way that most economists limit themselves, but start bringing in some of the sustainable development goals, we get, I think, a, a broader understanding and also one that informs policy. So in Figure 10, we have you know, a perfect uh, summation of how an economist will look at the Celtic Tiger. GDP is going up and unemployment goes down and then flattens out around 5%. Let's call that 5% full employment. Game over, everything's well, we can all retire. Uh, and, then, and this is all good news that the economy's doing well and unemployment's low, et cetera, but is that the whole story? Then the Great Recession hits, uh, and again, I apologize, it was advice from economists in Wall Street that made everyone in the world suffer. Uh, the basic advice is you don't have to worry about fraud and cheating. <laughs> Turns out you do. Uh, again, I point out the obvious. Okay, and then we see GDP per capita goes down, unemployment goes up. But unemployment doesn't go up uniformly, in fact, the gender differences between unemployment rates were significant in most of the countries, partly because the boom was so construction heavily influenced that males uh, were much more dra dramatically affected than in other recessions. Uh, but also the long-term unemployment rate is much more important than the short-term unemployment rate in terms of having a lasting effect. So short-term unemployment for an economist is easy to solve. Just get someone to spend more money. You can get the government to do it through deficit. You can try to get business to try to do it. Or you can, as Larry Summers told uh, Barack Obama, you can create another bubble. <laughs> How do you recover from a collapsed bubble? Create another bubble. Uh, but you know, so getting people to spend isn't the hardest thing uh, in the world. But if the problem is long-term unemployment, well, they're not going to be as affected. That's, they're not going to be absorbed back as quickly. Also important was need is for youth not in employment, education, or training. Now here we compare Ireland with our EU 15. So at the beginning of the recession, Ireland is equal to the average for the 15 countries. Everyone goes up, it's a major recession, this is going to happen, but Ireland more than doubles. Uh, so clearly the other countries were doing things to keep youth engaged that Ireland wasn't. Uh, this is not, you know, go to the moon rocket science. This is, let's look at what they do to keep youth engaged because you have eight, nine years of youth not engaged, that's a generational impact. I mean, these are problems that will be coming back uh, for the rest of their lives. Their incomes will be significantly lower. Their engagement and attachment to the formal labor market will be much less. Uh, so this is something that you have to not let happen 
in order to avoid the problems. It's not something, well, let's let it happen, then deal with the problems after it. Uh, it's too late then. Oops. Okay. Other aspects in terms of the poverty rate, again, here we see the poverty rate by age groups, and we see, of course, the poverty rate goes up for everyone except for 55 and older. Well, again, that tells you that you have to have different policies that address different groups. There's another thing which I go into a bit in the study, and that is there are two basic ways of measuring poverty. And in the United States, we have a budget, and then that we figure a poor family, this is how much they need to survive, and we just increase that by inflation, and that's our poverty threshold. Now, if the economy is growing, that's a very bad way of measuring it. And if the economy is growing and it's 30 years, 50 years later, it's a really bad way of measuring it. Uh, however, if the economy is shrinking, that's a better measure than what Europe does, which takes as a percentage of median income. Well, if the economy is growing, that shows you where you're fitting in a growing pie. But if it's shrinking, it underestimates the count of those who are poor. Because incomes fall, and so their proportion falls, but their expenditures aren't going to fall by as much. Uh, and so, you know, rents didn't go down by 20%, uh, and food didn't go down by 20%. So if incomes went down, or the threshold went down by 20%, we're assuming everything else did. Well, we, this is not hard to calculate. We can look at what, how their budgets changed. And so having a more uh, nuanced understanding would, I think, have a better sense of how the poor were being affected in, in downturn, during a downturn. And then the next graph looks at Ireland's commitment to, uh, this is Sustainable Goal, Development Goal 17, to the developing world. And of course, this collapses considerably. Ireland was building towards its commitment to 0.7%, and that fell dramatically and has yet to go up. Uh, but the last one I want to talk about is on the environment. Now, one of the major ways that the environment is being measured is uh, the decoupling of GDP from the use of materials. It's domestic material consumption is one of the major ways that this is measured when you want to compare different countries. And so if you look at figure 19, it looks like, wow. Well, you expect during recession, recession is good for the environment. So if people spend less, they're buying less, well, that means we're creating less pollution, that's good, uh, at least at that level. And so there, we would expect it to fall, but if the economy grows and that continues to fall, that's the goal. I mean, that's the main way of uh, governments are trying to address climate change, is how do we have rising standards of living using less materials, which will use up less of the environment, create less pollution. You know, so figure 19, you know, if you can end right there, uh, and you're in government, you do a victory lap. You know, this shows that Ireland is meeting their targets. But of course, they're not meeting their targets because the GDP number we know is overestimated. So we see in figure 20, the adjusted GNP is much less. But also, the major reason why Ireland's domestic material consumption is going down is because we're now importing uh, instead of using domestic materials. So if imports go up dramatically, well, then you're not really decoupling. You're just, well, we're creating the environmental effects, and we're just creating it in other countries, uh, other areas. And a lot of success that countries like the United States and much of the European Union has had in showing statistically that they're doing very well in reducing its environmental footprint is because they've been able to move the footprint to China and to other, uh, other areas. Uh, and of course, it's, those other areas are in the same planet. Uh, it's not really uh, a sustainable approach, uh, if we, not just to meet the goals, but to maintain uh, healthy lives and, and safe lives uh, on the planet. OK, now we get to the serious stuff. <laughs> from Social Justice Ireland will present the Sustainable Progress Index for 2020. Uh, and as I say, she's standing in for Dr. Catherine Kavanaugh, who can't be here today. Over to you. Thank you very much. 
very much. So how do you follow that? Um, so as Sean said, I'm standing in for Catherine, who unfortunately can't be here today. Um, the fact that I am short, blonde and wear glasses, I could have possibly got through it by stealth. Um, but I have come dressed as the SDGs, so the stealth thing didn't really work out for me. Um, so what I'm going to do is bring you through the index itself, and you should all have a copy of it. Um, but just to talk about, I suppose, the methodology behind it, the various indexes, how we've broken them into the kind of three sectors, um, and then later on, to talk about some policy proposals maybe after after the coffee break. Uh, so the starting point is the SDGs themselves, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. So they came into effect in June 2016, and many countries have been attempting to report on them ever since. Um, Social Justice Ireland, through our work with Charlie and Catherine and Neve, we've been tracking Ireland's progress on this, as, as, as Charlie and Sean have said, for the last number of years. But it's not just us who's looking at this. So Eurostat, the World Health Organization, the UN, the CSO, and the OECD, they've all committed to monitoring progress on, the, on this and to collecting data required by countries um, to ensure that they do try to achieve that progress. So the first thing that the authors of our report did was to have a look at a report that Eurostat published last year. Um, it isn't an index as such, but it does give a lot of information um, and provides conclusions as to how those authors, the Eurostat authors, thought countries in the EU28 were performing. So in doing this, they attempt to measure about 100 indicators, of which they say about 45 are multi-purpose, so they appear across a number of the SDGs, as we know that the SDGs are, are interrelated. Um, so the EU report notes that the improvement in achievement of the goals has occurred at a, a different pace, I suppose, for each of the SDGs, so from moderate to significant. And as you can see, um, as with previous years, they've created this kind of graphic here. So it shows at a glance where the SDGs are doing in terms of, of that progress. So, you know, where there has been progress, you can see up at the tip there, um, SDG 3, good health and well-being, continues to, to be a goal that the EU, the EU makes strong progress towards. Um, while the assessment of SDG 13 on climate action and SDG 9, industry innovation and, and infrastructure, is neutral, and that's down towards the kind of end of the arrow to your right-hand side as you're looking at it, or to your left-hand side as you're looking at it. Um, so one thing this report consistently points out, though, is that progress against any particular goal isn't necessarily sufficient in and of itself. So the progress has to be towards meeting the target um, under the Agenda 2030. Moving on then, um, in terms of gathering data for this report, the authors then had a look at work uh, by the Sustainable Development Solutions Network and the Institute for European Environmental Policy from last year. And that complements what Eurostat put together in their report. Um, and what they do is they provide detailed country profiles for each of the, the EU28, and they're then computed and ranked in terms of how far away from the goals they are. So, that what they do then is they produce country-specific dashboards, and that gives policymakers an idea and some guidelines in terms of the specific challenges that exist in their own countries. So the starting, or sorry, the, the dashboard for Ireland is here. Um, so in terms of the colour coding, green would mean not only are the indicators under the SDGs, not only are they showing progress, but that every indicator within that SDG is showing progress. So we can see that Ireland hasn't managed to get a green SDG yet. Um, the yellow, the orange and the red then indicate increasing distance from the SDG achievement. So looking at this, you can see six SDGs um, are where we face some challenges. We have significant challenges in seven, and then we have four major challenges. Moving on then to our, to our own report, the authors have collected significant data sets for this analysis. So simu similar to previous reports, the data selection began with the UN Global Indicator Set from 2017. They also then drew on the EU Indicator Set. So what that did um, when it was combined was ensured that the, the global data set was maintained while sitting within an EU context. Um, they also then employed a number of, of rules for themselves, so relevance and applicability. The data must be directly relevant 
um, related, similar or relevant to the monitoring of the SDG. Indicators that, that aren't directly relevant to the EU15 are excluded, for example, stunting, wasting, undernourishment. That, that's, not, that's more in terms of developing countries than, than the ones that we're looking at in our index. Um, other index, or sorry, indicators, although they're not official, UN indicators are included to capture a particular spirit or theme of a goal. So, for example, in SDG 10, there is an indicator in relation to household debt because, again, the authors found that the impact of the financial crisis is still having an impact on uh, the ability of, of many EU households to live decent lives. Um, the quality then, the authors would only use official published data from international sources. So again, Eurostat, the OECD, the World Health Organization, the UN and so on, and non-governmental organizations like Gallup and Transparency International. So that's to ensure that the most robust, the best data is being captured. In terms of coverage, they had to ensure that the data was available for all of the uh, EU 15 countries. So I know in previous years there were questions in relation to specific data sets that may have been available for Ireland, but if they're not available for the other 14 countries, they're not comparable as an indicator set, so we can't rank on that basis. Um, and then obviously the most recent data available must be used. So where it was out of date from maybe 2010, 2011, it would be excluded. So overall in this um, report, it uses 80 specific indicators across all 17 goals to arrive at the final scores. That compares to last year's report where 65 indicators were used. Now, obviously some challenges still remain. Data on the goals continues to be a persistent issue across the European countries. Um, so for example, in our report, you know, for most SDGs, we have a minimum of four indicators. However, for SDG 13, for example, there are only two, and there are three S or indicators then for SDGs 11 and 17. Now, there's a complete list of all the indicators for those of you who are really interested in, in going through them all um, back in the Appendix C of the report itself. Um, just finally then on the methodology, the first step in constructing this report is really to rescale all the data. So that makes it comparable across the countries. Um, and what that does then is allows the authors to benchmark Ireland at an indicator level, at an SDG level, and then to aggregate that and to give a ranking. So as in previous reports, equal weight is given to each of the SDGs because they are interrelated and they are then obviously independent. Um, they then provide a snapshot of Ireland's record across the three dimensions, so the economy, the society and the environment. And what that does is it mirrors the themes for Agenda 2030, so the social inclusion, economic development and environmental sustainability. And that then allows us to arrive at one aggregate sustainable progress index. So, moving on to the indices themselves, uh, the first one to look at is the economy index. Um, this relates to a combination of two goals, so SDG 8 and 9. Uh, SDG 8 concerns decent work and economic growth. It recognises the importance of inclusive and sustained economic growth. So it focuses on providing opportunities to eradicate forced labour, human trafficking and child labour globally by promoting labour rights and safe and secure working conditions. So six indicators are used here to compute this SDG. Um, it's well documented, and, and Charlie referred to it again, um, that Ireland is deemed to have a fast growing economy. We've got a relatively high GDP um, and GDP per capita, second only to Luxembourg. So the unemployment rate has also um, been uh, improving in the last while, and in the, the latest report, we're almost close to, to full employment. Um, in order to capture other components in relation to the SDG, so for example, the decent work element, um, the authors also include four additional indicators. So the employment rate, the niche rate, that is um, youth not in employment, education or training, um, accidents at work and average wages. So the overall rank, when you combine all of those for SDG 8, is 8th out of the EU 15. Moving on then to SDG 9, Industry, Innovation and Infrastructure. Um, this focuses on supporting inclusive and sustainable development. So technological progress, human well-being, with the aim of improving general living standards. 
So the goal here is to, uh, is to promote increased access to financial services and ICT and recognises the importance of that research and innovation for achieving the goals. So four indicators are used here, um, and that produces an overall rank um, for SDG, sorry, SDG 9 of 11th out of 15. So when these two goals have been combined, you can see that despite significant improvements around GDP and GDP per capita, there's still a fair bit of, of room to improve for Ireland, and we rank 11th overall in terms of the economy. Moving on then to the society index. So again, this, there's, a, there's a number of SDGs combined to create this index. They are one, two, three, four, five, 10, 16, and 17. So briefly in relation to those, SDG one, no poverty, um, is essentially looking for an end to poverty in all of its manifestations. So the authors of our report, they use four indicators here. And again, they're from Eurostat and the OECD. So that gives a more realistic sense of how we compare on this SDG. Um, so those indicators are the poverty rate, um, the rate of severe material deprivation as a percentage of the population, low work intensity households, and people living in deprived conditions. So the overall score there on poverty puts Ireland in ninth place. Denmark and Finland, and you'll be hearing those names a lot, uh, score highest on that SDG. Um, moving on then to SDG 2 and no hunger, that's concerned primarily with food security and the eradication of, of hunger. So in terms of sufficiency and supply, there aren't any major issues for the EU 15. The EU's nutrition-based issue is around obesity, um, and Ireland have the, the dubious honour of being the second highest in terms of our adult population, with over 25%. We're second only to the, the UK, who have just exited. Um, so we're looking at a, a, an even more dubious honour for next year, perhaps. Um, SDG 2 is also concerned with ensuring long-term productivity and the sustainability of agriculture. So there are four indicators used in terms of that element as well. Those are cereal yield efficiency, ammonia emissions from agricultural land, uh, gross nutrient balance of land, and the extent of organic farming. So overall, Ireland ranks ninth on this SDG. Now, clearly, healthy diets um, have a role to play here, as does securing sustainable um, production in terms of agricultural systems. And you can see clearly how the SDGs become linked. So in terms of poverty, you know, cheaper foods tend to be less nutritionally dense, which feeds into the obesity problem and, and feeds into that indicator for SDG 2. Um, SDG 3 then, good health and well-being, looks to ensure the health and well-being at all ages, so by improving reproductive, maternal and child health. This SDG also focuses on behavioural and environmental health risks. So in addition to indicators such as um, life expectancy, maternal well-being, neonatal well-being, mortality rates, and subjective well-being um, measures, it also contains indicators on um, instances of alcohol and smoking and chronic diseases, uh, sorry, deaths due to, to chronic diseases. So, um, under this SDG, there are a total of nine individual indicators, and Ireland scores somewhere in the middle of the rankings there at seventh. Again, Sweden, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg score highest, uh, respectively, in that regard. Moving on then to quality education, and one where Ireland actually does okay. Um, in fact, we do very well on, on this indicator. So this deals with access to equitable and quality education through all stages of life. So it focuses on increasing the number of youth and adults with employment and entrepreneurship opportunities and advocates lifelong learning. So you can even see from the goal of SDG 4 how it might link into SDG 8 and SDG 9 in terms of addressing the needs rate, for example. Um, it also aims to decrease gender and income inequalities in accessing education. So this is, as I said, one area where Ireland is doing relatively well. The share of the population aged 30 to 34 that have completed third level or equivalent education is, is highest um, at 56.3% in 2018. And Ireland also does well on the early leavers indicator, so it's the second lowest number of students dropping out of education. Performance in the PISA studies, so the, the studies around reading, maths and science, um, 
We're the second highest there as well. And our track record on employment of recent graduates is pretty good. Now, obviously, we know that within those data sets, you know, around educational disadvantage, there are clear disparities between those who live in disadvantaged areas and their more affluent peers. And we could do some serious work around our lifelong learning as well. But overall, Ireland ranks second against this SDG. On to SDG 5 then and gender equality. This aims at achieving gender equality by ending all forms of discrimination, violence and any harmful practices against women, recognising the need for equal rights and opportunities in decision making. So there are five indicators used here. Um, and the, the, the goal is, is essentially mixed on the selected indicators. So scores for the gender pay gap and the gender employment gap put Ireland in the middle ranking there, um, below the EU average. Indicators for both the share of women in national parliament and in senior management roles show us well below the, the EU average. And in fact, we're in the bottom three countries for both of those indicators. But on a positive note, in the area of education, the, the gender gap is actually reversed and women do better than men. Uh, overall, on this SDG, Ireland ranks 10th, um, with again Sweden, Finland and Denmark scoring highest overall. SDG 10 then, in terms of reduced inequalities, this concerns inequality relating to a vast array of things. So income, sex, ages, disability, race, class and ethnicity and religion within and among countries. It also focuses on increasing the income of the bottom 40% of the population by adopting policies and legislation. So for our index, the authors use four indicators to capture the theme of this goal, which generally show a mixed performance uh, for Ireland. So for example, while data for the measure of social justice indicates that Ireland has improved its ranking to seventh, household debt to disposable income remains high. So Ireland's score there is 11th in terms of the EU 15. Taking, taken together, the authors selected indicator for this um, SDG give a ranking of ninth. Now, obviously, with recent events in terms of social justice, um, it, it, it remains to be seen if that's going to continue in terms of progress. STG 16 then, peace, justice and strong institutions. So what that intends to do is promote peaceful and inclusive society for sustainability supported by human rights, access to justice and secure governance. The authors here include six indicators uh, for this goal. So a safe environment is captured by indicators of homicides, crime and a feeling of safe walk and home. Uh, a measure of confidence in the judicial system taken from Eurostat is included and the perception of corruption is taken from Transparency International um, and also the number of, of unsentenced detainees as a percentage of the population. So taken together then, the data show that Ireland is a relatively safe society um, with a low number of deaths associated with homicide or assault and a lower perceived occurrence of crime, violence and vandalism, ranking fifth out of the EU 15. And finally then, under the Society Index, we come to SDG 17, so the Partnerships for the Goal. And this focuses on the global macroeconomy and to ensure an open, universal and multilateral trading system for sustainable development under the, the WTO. So monitoring this, this SDG in EU, EU context focuses on the global partnerships and financial governance within the EU. So while progress has certainly been made, the EU as a whole is still well off its target of dedicating a share of 0.7% of its gross national income to ODA by 2030. Ireland's contribution of 0.31% of GNI is well below the EU average and in fact the target of 0.7 has only been met by four countries. So again, back to our friends in Denmark and Sweden um, and the United Kingdom and Luxembourg. So, as a member state of the EU, we have a fair bit to go in terms of, of reaching that commitment. Another indicator here um, refers to the share of environmental taxes as a proportion of revenue. So Ireland is on a par generally um, with the European average on this indicator and is ranked ninth out of the EU 15. Financial governance is captured on the basis of an indicator of general government gross debt, 
debt. Um, and this shows improvement, and Ireland's debt has fallen below the EU average, uh, currently at 63.6% of GDP. So based on the selected indicators here, Ireland's overall rank on SDG 17 is eighth, with a caveat that due to the ability um, of the available data to really capture the key themes here, um, that, that there, you know, there needs to be some caution with its use. But hopefully, as more data comes on stream, we will get better results there. So the combination um, for this society index shows that Ireland is kind of somewhere in the middle. We're at seventh place. And then the final leg of the, the three-leg table um, is the environmental index. So this is computed on the basis of SDGs 6, 7, um, 11, 12, 13, 14 and 15. So looking at SDG 6, clean water and sanitation, with the main aim of ensuring the availability, the cleanliness and hygiene and the management of sustainable water. So results for this SDG based on four indicators are, are quite mixed. The measure of fresh water withdrawal as a percentage of total renewable water resources shows Ireland scores well on that indicator. Indicators for access to improved drinking water and sanitation flow um, show that further development is required, so there's a, a, you know, that we're somewhere in the middle there. And then Ireland scores poorly on the proportion of wastewater that's treated, and so it achieves an overall rank of eighth against that goal. In terms of SDG 7, affordable and clean energy, which concerns access to reliable, affordable and sustainable energy services to fulfil demands. So here the authors again use four indicators. Ireland's CO2 emissions from energy fuels or combustion, electricity output are one of the highest in the sample. So we rank 12th out of the 15th there. The share of renewable energy is one of the lowest relative to our EU peers, and it falls well below the EU average. On the other hand, final energy consumption from um, new cars and the, ability, the score for the ability to keep warm as a percentage of the population places Ireland in the middle ranking at 8th. So the overall ranking on SDG 7 is 11th, but it still suggests that we have a fair bit of work still to do. SDG 11 then, sustainable cities and communities with an aim to design cities, towns and communities in a safe, resilient and sustainable manner. So this advocates for access to basic services for all, including safe and affordable housing, um, investing in infrastructure, including transportation and green public spaces, and improving planning and management in a way that is both participatory and inclusive. So three indicators are used on this goal. As some of the official indicators are omitted because they're more relevant to developing countries um, than the likes of the EU 15. Air pollution in Ireland is less of a problem in urban areas than it is in other EU countries, and Ireland is ranked third with the Scandinavian countries doing better. Less favourable is the satisfaction with public transport, where we rank 11th, and the, as the SDG calls for safe and affordable housing, um, there's an indicator in terms of housing cost overburden for rents included. So the overall score for quality of life in cities and communities um, is eighth. Moving on then to SDG 12, responsible consumption and production. This calls for the adoption of sustainable practices and procedures for business and an increase in environmentally friendly activity by consumers to enhance sustainable consumption and production. So it's on both sides of the production um, sphere. In the EU, the focus is on developments in the area of decoupling, as, as Charlie said, environmental impacts from economic growth. So energy consumption and waste generation and management. Unfortunately, Ireland ranks quite poorly on this SDG based on the author's five selected indicators. So the production of municipal waste is one of the highest among the EU. The recycling rate of municipal waste is very low. Um, and the Eurostat indicator for circular material use as a percentage is the second lowest of the countries. While the pattern for CO2 emissions from new passenger cars paint a more favourable picture, as does the indicator reflecting resource productivity, it's still not enough and we rank 12th against this goal. For SDG 13, climate action, 
This concerns the integration of climate change mitigation and measures into strategies and policies to reduce the severity of the effects of climate-related hazards and natural disasters. Now, problems with data availability here in terms of reliability and comprehensive measures across the EU15 um, make this one of the, the SDGs that international agencies, as well as ourselves, find problematic in terms of determining important trends. So a key indicator used by Eurostat is the greenhouse gas emi emissions, the GHG. So in recent years, Ireland has witnessed fluctuations in our GHG emissions, but continues to be well above the EU average. I think even our own Taoiseach called us the laggards in terms of GHG emissions. Um, we're failing to meet the EU commitment as part of Europe 2020 to reduce our GHG by 20% compared with our 1990 levels. Given the data limitations, the SDG measure here comprises just two indicators, so GHG per emissions per capita and the effective carbon tax rate. So Ireland's performance on SDG 13 is poor, um, with a score ranking it in 13th place. SDG 14, life below water, with the aim to conserve and sustain the use of oceans, seas, and marine resources. So our SDG 14 is computed using four indicators for 13 countries. So because Austria and Luxembourg are landlocked, they don't have any, any data on this. Um, Ireland is struggling to achieve its sustainable objectives in this area, and it ranks 11th of those 13 countries. And then finally, on the Environment Index, um, SDG 15, Life on Land. So that seeks to protect, restore and promote the conservation and sustainability of ecosystems. So this is one of the key goals, together with uh, the, the previous one, that incorporate environmental considerations. Here, the authors have settled on five indicators to reflect this goal. So data from BirdLife International imply that Ireland is doing relatively well on the share of protected terrestrial um, areas and freshwater areas. And Ireland is ranked among the top three for both of those indicators. Indicators for imported diversity threats on the red list index show there's scope for improvement there. However, at just 11%, the share of land dedicated to forestry use is well below the EU average. So we have an overall ranking um, on that SDG of ninth. So the analysis obviously shows the scale of the challenge there, and Ireland ranks the lowest of the EU 15 on the environmental index at 15th. So where do we stand overall on the aggregates? Here we have the Composite Sustainable Progress Index, and once again you can see the countries Sweden, Finland, Denmark topping the rankings. Ireland's overall ranking is 10th. So in terms of our strengths, uh, we're in the top third for just two of the SDGs. So we continue to perform well on SDG 4 in terms of education and are relatively okay on SDG 16 in terms of peace, justice and strong institutions. In terms of our weaknesses, um, we're particularly low in the rankings on the environment, as you could see, um, and there are clearly pressing sustainability issues that have to be addressed there. The low score on SDG 9 in terms of industry, innovation and infrastructure also points to significant challenges in those areas. Um, and then we're really somewhere in the middle on everything else. So addressing the complexities of sustainable development require a joined up thinking approach. Um, successful implementation of the SDGs really requires a balance between economic and social progress and sustaining the planet's, planet's environment and resources, as well as addressing our, our, our climate change issues. And then in terms of the alternative measures of progress, the performance of each of the EU 15 countries on alternative measures is shown here, and this is also an appendix to the index. So these alternative measures are attempting to capture different aspects of progress and well-being. Ireland does well on both the Human Development Index and the GDP per capita, and we talked about that, um, and less favourably on the SDG Global Index and the Social Progress Index and World Happiness Index. Just looking at the Social Progress Index um, for a little bit, there's been very little movement between 2014 and 2019 in terms of Ireland's progress there. Um, and that the key results are set out. So according to its three broad categories, Ireland is ranked sixth for opportunity and eighth uh, for both basic human needs and foundations of well-being. So the results really imply that we have a long way to go to reach our 2030 goals. Continuous monitoring of all the indicators that make up the goals is an absolute requirement, and it really needs to be used extensively by policymakers to develop a plan for more sustainable development. Thank you.
I think you'll agree with me that that was a tour de force in terms of stepping in for Dr. Catherine Cavanaugh. <laughs> now, we, there are a whole series of policy implications for Ireland uh, that flow from this, both nationally and locally, but we will present those after the coffee break. But we have a few minutes before the coffee break, so we're prepared to take a, a few questions or uh, observations that people might have, preferably uh, questions, and um, we'd see how we might be able to, uh, to deal with them. So if anybody has a question, yes? We'll start away here. We take, by the way, we'll take them in groups of three or four. Yeah, whatever. You, you might just take the microphone there. That's good. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, my name is Tom Roach. Uh, I'm from a small group called Just Forest. I'd just like to congratulate you. This is very timely. Um, do you see change? We, we have 10 years to get this thing right, to get the global goals achieved, and to bring all of the negativities that you've mentioned to positives. Is it up to the individual to change attitude, or is it up to policy change at a higher level? Or is it, is it I, I, so personally I think it's a combination of both. But, but to be honest, I had a discussion with my friend here this morning, and we're really at opposite ends of uh, the, uh, the measuring stick. I, I personally feel that it, 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 the, the, the public have to be much more active and much more engaged in this and change attitude by their purchasing policies. Whereas, uh, you know, other people say, Tom, no, that's not going to work. It has to be at a much higher level. So I'd like your advice on that. Okay. Yes. There. Thank you very much. Uh, we'd ask if you if you might identify yourself for everybody. Tom. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Adekunle Gomez uh, from the African Cultural Project. Uh, back in the 80s, I used to read uh, books uh, by Schumacher and um, his uh, colleagues. And my question is, um, uh, does uh, Professor Clark think those um, uh, uh, works are still relevant as far as the SDGs are concerned? Thank you. Good question. Behind you there, yes. Deirdre. Thanks. Uh, Deirdre de Berko with Forus. Um, I suppose my question is really about uh, including Goal 17 under the social index, because Goal 17, even though it is global partnership about unprecedented levels of international cooperation that are going to be necessary, it also contains the means of implementation, and they include trade, financing for development, technology transfer, and so on, which are as economic as they are social. So just wondering, was there any kind of reflection on that, or did it seem natural to put it into the social, because it, it, Goal 17 is the motor or the engine of, of the rest of the SDGs, so just wondering whether any Absolutely. consideration was given to that. Thanks. That's a good question. Anything else? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll proceed with the, with the three of those for, uh, for things. So um, the issue about personal or policy-focused, uh, you know, the priority. So you want to fire this? Sorry? Yeah, you're far away. Oh, well, with the first one, obviously it has to be both because for one, individual attitudes are greatly shaped by society and also in the long run greatly shaped by laws uh, and rules that informs people what is acceptable, not acceptable. So that's the whole socialization factors break into forming how individuals will uh, behave and the choices they'll make. But also it goes the other way around. The, the, the individuals changing their choices uh, filters up. Uh, we see this, I think, a lot with, uh, in the United States with millennials. Uh, they just think differently and have different sort of categories of what's important to them. The environment is very important to them. And they not only politically are advocating for these issues, but also in the choices they make. Their consumption patterns are different. Uh, eventually that will become mu much more mainstreamed. Uh, one of the most important social movements in the United States in the 60s and 70s was uh, uh, Ralph Nader's consumer rights movement and that getting people to think about how they spend their money as a political act and sending the signal to businesses, these are the goods that we want and, these, and we don't want 
harmful goods. We don't want cars that aren't safe. We don't want food that pollutes us. Uh, that has a big effect. Now, business will play it up and you get a lot of greenwashing where the, they spend more time making it look like they're achieving it. Uh, but eventually, those people become managers and then it becomes much more real. So it, 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 if it isn't both, it's not going to happen. It has to, in the end, we all have to change how we make decisions. The goal is, the short-term goal every country is looking for is how can we have the exact same standard of living and use less goods and create less pollution. Uh, and that will get you part way. But, uh, at some point, uh, the realization is that, no, we need to make different decisions, which means our standard of living might be rated the same, but it's going to be a very different standard. Uh, and it won't be so based on consuming. Uh, so I, I like to explain this uh, to my students that uh, you can buy children a lot of toys that just don't last, or you can buy a few toys that last for generations. And, you know, and the child is just happy having the toy. Uh, but we move towards a high waste society because that generates profits. And we have to come up with other ways of, of making our valuations and also funding and pricing everything so that other values also can be reflected. And that will mean that people will be making different choices. And I expect that our the next generation will have very different uh, sort of bundle of consumption decisions than we have. Okay. I, I would just add to that that um, one of the experiences of Ireland, very strong experience, is that policy has undermined what needs to be done. Um, while uh, it is absolutely true that you need both, I agree totally with Charlie, and I agree with the analysis that he's using as well. But I think the Irish experience quite often has seen policy undermine what needs to be done even when people want to do it. And certainly policy has not encouraged people in many cases to do the, what is required. And I think all we have to do is look at our environmental score here to, to see something that's very profound really when we find ourselves in last position in terms of ranking uh, out of the EU 15 in terms of the goals. Uh, Ireland, this supposedly beautiful, green, you know, all this kind of stuff country, uh, winds up at the bottom of the line. Uh, that, that's a very bad story. I think a lot of it has to do with the failure at a, an institutional level to deal with it. Now, there are huge challenges individually as well for individuals, so it's not easy, but I, th I think without the policy stuff, we're in trouble. We need to, there's a couple of other, as I'm watching the time, a couple of other uh, questions. The question about, about uh, Schumacher and uh, Small is Beautiful and is this still relevant? Uh, either you want to? Well, okay. so much of that becomes uh, how this is lived out in a local setting. And you know, we will see when we look at the uh, policy suggestions, both national and local. I mean, Small is Beautiful. Uh, Shoemaker was uh, an economist who was very influenced by Gandhi, but he also was realizing that uh, when you aggregate at such a high level, you miss the human connection to the economy, and that looking at things in terms of the economy in which people live uh, makes you see things in a much more interconnected way because you're seeing how it's affected. And so eventually not only individuals but individuals and communities are going to have to look at themselves as a unit that have to solve problems uh, in a way that improves well-being and in a way that's sustainable. So um, I, I, I think Schum, Schum, Schumacher comes in waves. It's popular that it goes down. I, if you were going to invest in a stock, we'll invest in Shoemaker becoming popular again. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's I, th I think it's quite related to the first question in terms of you know everybody has that role to play, um, and that there is that kind of individual um, obligation for want of a better word, but also that that policy needs to enable that and needs to facilitate that to be 
you know, um, to be possible for people at an individual and a societal level, at a community level as well. Um, and as Charlie said, when you, when you look at the policy recommendations that we've made, we specifically made them at local and national level to demonstrate how, you know, it's not just, you know, a European thing, it's not just a national government thing, that there is, there's, there is a role for everybody in this um, and that right down to, to local government in terms of how they operate their budgets, how they spend them, what they do and the decisions that they make um, and how everybody can contribute in terms of, of the goals. And we might move on to uh, question three, the, um, the, the, the goal 17 um, and it being a social, uh, it's under the social rather than the others. I think one of the things that the authors had to deal with, and we've been in and out on this from the day one that we've started working with, with Charlie and Catherine and you uh, to generate this uh, index. Um, in the, the issue for us is that those in the, uh, goals could fit under, uh, many of them could fit under two, a few of them could even fit under the three components, if you like. And we were basically pulling them apart for analytical purposes only. The point you make about uh, the goal 17 has all these trade and other issues and therefore should be economic, it certainly should fit there. But I suppose uh, it, it could fit there, but I, the reason we put it where we put it is that the, the society is making a decision about, for example, its third world aid and its, uh, and, and, and its engagement at that level. And the decision isn't all that great, but it's a societal decision about helping other societies. And that seemed to be maybe the best place to, 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 to locate it, if you like. But there's, um, you know, it's, it's a kind of open story that we could, we could go quite in, quite a number of these could go over and back. What we're trying to do is, is basically provide some kind of index, comparison, show how we're doing on each of them, and trying to then give people, you know, people could get lost in the 17 goals. And one of the big things that we're always going on about is you need to look broader than just within a narrow uh, uh, item. And the narrow issues have to be dealt with. And the individual goals deal with poverty and hunger and cities and uh, water and land and so on, and international cooperation. Uh, but the issue, I suppose, we were pulling them together into economic and social and environmental because they're the kinds of categories people understand and they're the kinds of levels that need to be moved. And we could be doing very well on some of these, and we are, but we could be fooling ourselves even within the social one. We think we, we, we score very high on education, for example, but there, we're, we're nowhere near, we're number two on education, but we're way down uh, overall on it. <coughs> On the, on, the, on the social side. So we're just trying to bring that to, to bear as well. Um, I'm conscious we're, we're coming up to um, coffee time, basically. And we'll come back. There's, there's more space for questions um, uh, after the presentation on the policy. What we're going to do is we'll ask you, please, I know normally uh, at these things, uh, breaks, we said 30 minutes, uh, that the break goes on a bit beyond that. We will start exactly on 30 minutes because we have an audience uh, watching us as well uh, on the internet and uh, we are telling them now we're going to be back at 11.45 and we will start on that and we will ask people please be back by then, okay? And we will proceed then with the policy uh, implications both national and local and we will have more space for questions and answers. Thank you very much.